Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this Digital Cities Lunchtime panel session in partnership with Hello Culture and the School of Digital Arts, or SODA, at Manchester Metropolitan University. I'm Dr. Kirsty Fairclough from the School of Digital Arts, and I'm delighted to be chairing today's event. So it's been over six months now since COVID hit in the UK and the whole country was put into lockdown and out of lockdown and back into lockdown. Um, and as a society, we've adjusted and become used to what is often being described as the new normal. But what the pandemic has amplified is absolutely the value of telling stories to remind us of what we all have in common, even while maintaining our physical distance. And our panel will explore the unique experience of the creation of work during lockdown and the ways in which artists have approached storytelling in a context where audiences were and are entirely digital. So I've got a wonderful panel joining me today um, talking about their experiences. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Paulette Brooks, who is the CEO and Artistic Director of Serendipity, which is a diversity led arts organisation based in Leicester. We have with us James Yarker, who's the Artistic Director of Stan's CAF. And we have Jimmy Fay, who is the Executive Producer of the Lyric Theatre Belfast. So uh, hello and welcome everybody. Um, before we get started, we have just a couple of um, bits of housekeeping um, and information to give you. Firstly, closed captions are available by clicking on CC at the bottom of the screen. There is an option there to view the full transcript as well as displaying the scrolling subtitles and we'll be recording this session too so you'll be able to watch it again on the Hello Culture website. So in terms of the format of this session then we'll be hearing from our panel for the first 40 minutes or so and then in the last 20 um, minutes or so we'll be taking questions from you uh, in our audience so please do put your questions into the chat and we'll do our best to get through as many of them as we can. Okay so with venues um, forced to close uh, since late March this year, many people working within the arts and culture sectors have um, continued to connect with audiences, both old and new, through really thinking laterally, creatively, and embracing new digital opportunities. Uh, and one such person is Paulette um, Brooks from Serendipity. And I think we're just gonna have a quick look at, at um, some of uh, Paulette's work before she um, talks to me. Hi Paula, it's lovely to have you here. Hi Kirsty, thank you Hi. for inviting me. You're very welcome. Um, so then, um, let's just go back a little bit. So you'd already delivered your press launch for this for this year's live dance festival when lockdown happened. I mean, uh, how was that, and what was your response, and what was it like, of course, when when lockdown actually did happen? Well, for us, it, this was such a big year because it's our 10th birthday and normally or traditionally we've done our press launch in London. But this year we decided we've got new premises. We were going to do our press launch. So on the 12th of March, we did our press launch and it was fabulous. And then on the 16th of March, we postponed. So we postponed slightly ahead of the announcement and we postponed slightly ahead because I'd been traveling quite a lot and with travel, I could see that things were changing. I could see that the culture was changing and things were not quite, quite right. And so we postponed on the 12th of March and, and within doing that, by the 20th of March, we'd announced an alternative LDIF, which you just saw a sneak preview of the, the digital mm -hmm. um, uh, festival that we did. And so we had to, within those what four days, we had to speak to every single artist. Now remember our artists are international. So I was on the phone at all different hours of the day. So midnight I could be on the phone because I'm trying to communicate with another country. And, and we decided that we wanted to, uh, one, we wanted to look after our artists. So it was really difficult. Do you, you can't cancel, you've postponed, 
and you don't know what the future is going to be you know so um we talked to them about sharing footage of films that they got we looked at the the, the archive materials that we had to help us create things and, and we spent four days pulling together a festival so not only did we decide to go digital um within that during that period, my brother lost his sight. And um, so I've learned new things about um, uh, disability and visual impairment. So we decided to do captioning, BSL, audio descriptions, mm -hmm. transcripts, everything. So we also decided to do that on top of going digital, which again, were two new things for us. Um, and to continue with the exhibition that we were doing, but do it as a digital exhibition. So everything was new and we got it all ready by the 20th of March. Gosh, incredibly short period of time, isn't it? It is, wow. because the 23rd of March lockdown began. Of course, yeah. So, so you have know, you uh, ever delivered a digital or online programme at all before? Because that is such a, you know, to be able to pivot that completely in four days is incredible. So you um, must have had some experience before. Um, we've not, we've done some, uh, we've made short films and we've done mm. things like that, but you know, we're, we're not, we were not, um, experts in digital technology in that way um, but decided that that's what we needed to do because um, as I said it was our 10th it's our 10th birthday and we're damned if we were just going to stop um, and so we decided that we you know just you know looked at the team looked at our resources looked at our skill set and decided that we were going to this is what we were going to do and we were going to build this program and have dance dialogues and look at the way at zoom and things like that work now for me I work internationally, so I'm always on a Zoom before Zoom or, you know, FaceTime or Skype became fashionable. And so I've been communicating in this way with artists for a long time and also sometimes viewing work um, uh, this way. So it was taking my everyday practice and making it into a reality in terms of how we did we did the festival. So, so that's what that's what we started to do. And that's what we did in, as I say, in a very condensed time. So we decided to stick to the framework of the festival as well. And so we did decide that the festival, it would launch on the 29th of April, which is International Day of Dance, and it would still do the 10 days that we always did. And we would still keep, stick to the same artists on the same days, but digitally. And so we, so we ended up producing um, uh, one online exhibition, 22 short films, which included 15 audio descriptions and BSL, ASL and open captions five podcasts in terms of new podcast series. We did a new concept, um, um, 30 Seconds of Freedom, which is trying to look at how, what it was like to be locked down in, in, in this time and what would it feel for artists. We had over 50 artists in that from 11 different countries. We platformed a new artist each day and we made the festival free. Um, so we did all of this and, and then it was like, the press got on top, top of it, everyone got on top of it. Um, and we did our launch as a Zoom. I'd never done a launch Zoom before and um, decided that everyone needed to dress up for the launch, um, get their drinks, um, be lined up with their drinks. And then we would do this press launch. We didn't know what it was gonna look like, but it was, it, it was fantastic. People came with good spirits. Um, and literally, and um, and um, talk to us about it, and we just embraced mm -hmm. everything that we that we were doing, um, and so within that as well, we still produced. Um, our publication that we were doing as well. So we still also produced a new publication about the dance festival and about the work that that, that, that we were doing. Wow. So what was that experience like still being able to communicate those stories? I think it's it's been fantastic being able to communicate those stories and, and um, also it felt that we were connecting people as well. So because we worked internationally, we became a new um, connected family because we could reach out and work together. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought it was important to share those stories and share those views from just not just from a local perspective, but also an international one of how really the world's got so much smaller. Um, and um, yeah, I think at, at, at the end of it, we, we realised that the, going forward, you know, technology is now ingrained in what, what we're doing. It's not going to be, oh, it's how do we do this? It's all it's become part of the culture of the organisation in terms of what we're doing. So now all our publications are digital as well as physical. So we don't you know, we automatically think of the digital and it's not an afterthought. It's it's integral to the way that we work. Wow. Um, so we've done sort of like um, five years growth, I think, the, the, the way they're describing it in like, in like six months is what I think a lot of people have done. So in a very short space of time, um, we've had to have that growth period that if 
we hadn't had COVID and hadn't had um, lockdown, it would have taken it would have taken longer to get there, and we just had to grow up quite quickly, really. Uh, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're going to have a quick look at the um, thirty seconds of freedom clip actually, um, okay. just now. were the artists then to to this experience I mean how did you find that they were um, kind of reacting and engaging um uh, the artists really embraced it and they worked with us and we talked to them and they and the process was that we didn't just um bob an email to somebody you know it was about talking them through what it, it was what we wanted to do how we would present their work what it would look like and also you know moving through that and saying that actually okay we've done this it this way this time but going forward we'd have to look at it in terms of how people pay for the services because obviously it's about also keeping the economy alive as well it's about serving the artists serving the organizations so moving from that thing of just um uh, everything being free to making the next step change to that that people would need to pay for some of these services as well yeah. and, and having that discussion with them and moving them through that 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 sort of journey yeah, it's a complex thing, isn't it? And how did um, audiences generally react or engage with the work? Well, we uh, have been pleasantly surprised in terms of the engagement levels that we've got. I mean, it really has shot up. I think um, internationally, I think people knew about us a lot more, but we've done yeah. so much more now on a local level in, in terms of people being aware of us. And then the other thing that we did is that everything we put on, we put on a 24 hour clock. So that meant that any point in the time in the world, you could get a point to access it. So when we programmed, we thought about the international nature of it. So something that's happening, if we said it was a seven o'clock start, Mm -hmm. it could be five o'clock in the morning somewhere else yeah. so if things were um, time limited people could still go to it but it always had a 24-hour window or we looked at a time lapse um, after that so people could access it for a couple of days so we could also work with our international artists as well Mm -hmm. fantastic work it really is we're going to come back to you Paula at the uh, a bit later on in the kind of panel discussion but thank you very much for introducing us to that to your work um, just now and we'll we'll come back to you shortly I'm going to now introduce um, James Yarker who is the artistic director of Stan's Caf in Birmingham uh, James you've worked for years as a, a company which revels in the kind of playful live experience of well theatre primarily so what did lockdown force you to explore thanks Kirsty so uh, yeah, I think the thing that uh, working live um, is so different from working online and lockdown really forced us to confront what that difference was, you know, what does a theatre company do when it works online? And the first thing that we were interested in was a piece we'd made a few years before called The Anatomy of Melancholy, which is an adaptation of a 400 year old book about all the different forms of melancholy there are, what their causes are, uh, how you uh, can identify the symptoms and what cures might be. So we thought the content was really appropriate for the lockdown, but the form wasn't right because it was more than two hours long in a theatre show. And who wants to sit in front of a computer screen and watch more than two hours of text written by someone more than 400 years ago, <laughs> apart from the RSC online people. So we uh, decided we needed to adapt our adaptation. So we got uh, got our editing tools out and we took our script down to 35 episodes, each of which was about three minutes long, which felt mm -hmm. much more appropriate for an online audience. Uh, so we got the original cast back again. Uh, we got them in their own homes with their own contemporary costumes on. And we spent, uh, what was it? We, spent two hours a day, two days a week recording this thing. Um, and we managed to average about one uh, episode an hour, I suppose. And I'd really like you to see uh, about 50 seconds of episode 28, which is how you might cure yourself if you are suffering from melancholy brought on by poverty. The world hath forsaken ye, yet know this, that the very hairs of thine head are numbered 
and God is a spectator of thy miseries. He sees thy wrongs, woes, and wants. Tis his good will and pleasure it should be so. He knows what is better for thy good than thou thyself. His providence is over all at all times. He set a guard of angels over us. He keeps us as the apple of his eye. Beyond all hope and expectation, many things fall out. And who knows what may happen? All the suns are not yet set. A day may come to make amends for all. Wonderful stuff. So um, how did the actors respond to the idea, first of all? They, they really loved working on the original, so they were very happy to revisit it. And they all got on really well together, so they were very happy to be working together again. And they were very happy to have some work full stop. So, um, so that was great. And of course, the anatomy of melancholy itself is a kind of self-help book. So it cured us all of melancholy in its own way by working on it. And it gave uh, Stan's Caff a massive boost, the fact we were still mm. making art. It was really exciting. Mm. And what did you have in terms of audience reactions? I mean, how do people respond to it? Uh, it was it was really positive. I think people were making real connections with this very old text, which seemed to have these great uh, resonances with the um, contemporary times. That episode 28, uh, I wanted to share because of Escher's unexpected appearance in it, so beautifully <laughs> timed on the text, something that wouldn't happen if we were not recording in our own homes. Um, but having said that, other episodes are a bit more spectacular in that we used the fact people could record in their bedrooms or their bathrooms or in their gardens. So, mm -hmm. And can you tell us about for quality purposes, which uh, yeah, I so find very moving. Once we made um, The Anatomy of Melancholy, mm -hmm. we wondered what it would be like if we made an original production uh, from scratch in this new form. And um, I was trying again to think about what uh, content might fit this thin sort of mediated form of online working and I thought about those relationships that we have with call centre workers where it's thin and distance and mediated but still really important and often quite frustrating and emotional and um, so we started to to work on that and we were wondering whether our uh, real world rehearsal devising process could transform uh, into an online process so we spent five days with five actors uh, discussing, uh, challenging each other, sharing ideas, improvising, writing, and finally recording a piece that's about 24 minutes long. But I'd like to show you, uh, again, about 50 seconds from a section where people are trying to get through security. Great. How many fingers am I holding up? And who do you most admire? Should I try one of your other questions? We have, um, what is your favorite film? And what's your favourite band? Have the 18th and 37th letter of your password, please. I'm afraid there are a limited number of attempts I can allow you. And one last question. Was it always meant to be this way? As long as your mother-in-law. What was your first memory? Sir, it's your security question. You're supposed to know the answer. That's the whole point. You're supposed to know the answer. It's not difficult. You choose an answer and you stick to it. It doesn't have to be true, it just has to be the answer when we ask you the question. My favourite film changes every day, but when my bank asks me, it's always Sunset Boulevard. So how was the whole process? Because, you know, I, I know that this, this piece got um, a lot of attention and uh, quite rightly so, it, it was brilliant. So, uh, yeah, the whole process of, the, of, of conceiving it and, and making it in this, these conditions. I was surprised at how similar it felt to being in the real world. Oh. Uh, we were probably a bit more disciplined. There was probably less drinking tea and looking out of the window than we <laughs> might do in the real world. Um, I probably wouldn't want to only ever live like this. Um, streaming was difficult. Um, we were very aware, aware of not wanting to intrude too much on the privacy of the performers. Uh, mm. I think we were also a bit jaded with seeing the inside of other people's living spaces by this point, hence this sort of blackout world with the floating heads, etc. cetera. 
And um, sorry, I thought I heard something in the background then. <laughs> Probably you literally heard my dog. <laughs> Perfect timing. So um, how important do you think it is to still be able to connect with audiences and, and tell familiar stories during uh, times like these? Um, I suppose I'm not massively interested in telling stories, but kind of sharing feelings and thoughts and, mm -hmm. and provocations, I think is really important. Uh, mm -hmm. And although I suppose we, um, we miss having an audience there live in front of us, uh, we probably ended up performing to roughly the same number of people, just mm -hmm. much more thinly spread around the globe. Mm -hmm. And what was the response then? And did you gain new audiences from kind of, you know? I think inevitably, yeah, inevitably we gained new audiences. Um, I see that over a thousand people saw the for quality purposes thing. So if we went on a short tour, we'd be happy to have performed to a thousand people. Mm -hmm. but I suppose you never know the quality of that engagement or were there loads of people gathered around or was it one person watching it over and over again? Um, and we didn't get any money off any of them. So that was a bit annoying. Yeah, I think we've got to find that um, way to bridge that, haven't we? And, and kind of, the, yeah, it's difficult and monetizing that work and, and finding a way to, to make it work as a, a conceptually, I think. But um, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. I'm going to now uh, come back to you at the panel discussion. Thank you, James. And now I'm going to talk to uh, Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy Fay is the artistic director of the Lyric Theatre in Belfast. Uh, welcome, Jimmy. Thanks, Kirsty. And um, you're uh, the kind of you conceived the idea of this splendid isolation um, project. And I think we're going to have a, a look at um, this clip just now, just to sum up how um, just quite how dramatic that uh, first lockdown was. I think we'll have a look at that now. Yeah, so when we were doing this first and going back um, in June, and if you look at these pictures, we thought these were going to be great archives because it was just towards the end of lockdown and you can see how empty the streets are. It was a sort of beauty that these pictures have been made, like Virgil Kane is our BBC producer and I think he got in the lead from these ones. And just at the end of it here, you come to the I think the lyric itself, uh, the thing about the lyric is it is the, it's the premier producing theatre in Northern Ireland. It's an absolutely beautiful space. It was built 10 years ago, but it's got an over 50 year history. It's been on this site for over 50 years and it's famous for never closing its doors. Actually, all this footage here is showing kind of like how we have to learn and shoot and adapt uh, during lockdown. And can you tell us a little bit more about, I mean, it's just, gosh, you just remind you how dramatic that, that moment was in all of our lives. Um, just the whole concept of Splendid Isolation and what the project actually entailed. Well, again, it goes back to, we, we, we're a really busy theatre and we had maybe, um, we had two huge shows that were going on at that time, 1984 and Good Vibrations. And Good Vibrations is a brilliant show about Terry Hooley, who's an amazing record and um, uh, producer from Northern Ireland who discovered uh, uh, the undertones, Teenage Kicks, and that was going to go to New York and everything. So we had an amazing year ahead of us. And all of that came crashing down, as Paul had said, on the 23rd of March, actually mm -hmm. just before, because we made the decision to close a week earlier. Because we're on the island of Ireland, the South had closed, and we felt we needed to follow suit on that as well. Just like Paul had said, I'd been in New York, and you could see the world changing. Yeah. So it was just some way of kind of like adapting to it. So the first thing we did was a piece called... Um, uh, free Speak, which was based in 1984 thing, which was a series of uh, different artists from different disciplines, dance, political theatre and stuff like that. And we all did these online things and it was a great learning curve to, to, to put uh, music and that, uh, stuff and clowning actually, that was the important thing as well. And we put these on each week as a kind of soap opera and it worked really well. Mm. And then Stephen James Yeoman, who was from BBC Arts, had been in touch. We were going to do a project earlier and, you know, BBC and I got in touch and we all wanted to do something together and see how this would work. And we could see like what the Abbey had done was a Dear Ireland thing, which was like this, you know, you sit at your, um, you know, for the most part, your laptop and you do a new play and stuff. And it was brilliant, but we didn't feel we could follow that. The same Dear Scotland, uh, National Scotland did that as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we wanted to do was make little films. 
So we approached seven artists who were really dear to the Lyric, who've had an association with the Lyric, from Owen McCafferty and David Ireland to Lisa McGee, famous from Berry Girls, uh, Sarah Gordon, Lather Sherman, and Stacey Gregg and Abby Spallon. And they were absolutely brilliant artists that we wanted to work with, who had either worked as artists in residence with us or written plays that we produced. And the whole thing was rather than just getting directors that the BBC would put on, is I was really interested in using theatre directors for the most part, or people who would who would adapt, who would, who could somehow jump from theatre into film, um, because we're really keen to make these as short films. They somehow have some connection with the theatre and some connection with the society, the whole society, as much as possible of Northern Ireland, you know, because there's many different kind of aspects to the whole of the North. And, you know, it was done really quick. The writers had about seven to, they re really had a week to write the scripts and then maybe another week of revision. We cast them, we, I mean, one great thing is that some of the writers were in the shows, like Latter was in her own show and Sarah Gordon was in her own uh, show. But then some of the writers, like Owen McCaffrey, particularly what to write for Stella McCusker, and then Stacey wrote for Kerry Quinn and wanted Emma Jordan to direct it. And all that stuff worked really well. And they all had a connection. All the writers had a connection with the directors, like Cathy Brady, who is a huge, phenomenal film director now. She's just released Wildfire, which is worth seeing. Had it, had done a play reading of Abby Spallin's play, Lally Scott, years before. So they all had these different connections. They also lived in the same areas and near the same areas. Like it was shot a little bit around Northern Ireland. So the whole thing about learning about social isolation, because all of this was still new to us. Like nobody had really done that much. We were BBC and the Lyric were learning how to make films together in this new world. It wasn't like arriving on set with a huge crew and having a makeup artist and having kind of hairdressers and all that kind of stuff. You had to have a certain amount of preparation. We had an amazing production manager, Aiden, Adrian Mullen, who works with us as he's the head of production in the Lyric, and he was able to kind of set up his little stall. But that was it. And you had Jim and you had Davey, who were the uh, cameraman and the sound man. And they were essential. Well, obviously they were essential. But Jim also wanted the opportunity to work with these remote cameras. Mm. And the thing about remote cameras is you leave them, like Stella, for example, is of an age where she would have been at high risk. So we had to leave the cameras with her for three days, which meant we had to film other stuff much earlier. Or, you know, we had to get stuff done much earlier. And the whole thing was quite a tight um, deadline. Um, but it, it was a really interesting way to work. And I, I think the thing about the cameras is then they're in and a remote. And you know, real rehearsal with them. You just have to set them up. And I think there's a shot with Stella that we'll do later on, but just trying to kind of get that shot right mm. while it's out in Gale outside, yet she's inside the thing and trying to shout directions in was, it was really interesting. It was really, it was tricky and stuff. Mm. The main thing about it was the diversity. And it was about the, these, all of these artists, directors and writers and actors working together in a bubble for want of a better term. Yeah. These little films. Yeah, so clearly a huge learning curve for you and the team. Uh, what were the kind of the major challenges did you find? Well, it was interesting. The um, time was really interesting because there was really very little time to do all of this because the yeah. BBC and I came on and they put a date to broadcast, which then uh, propelled BBC4 as well, I think, which was really exciting, actually, you know, because initially I think this thing could have taken months and actually it took weeks. And it focused everybody's head, like a lot of people's head, just to get the work done. And they were all really keen to do it. Because if you think about it, the world literally stopped. Now, we call it splendid isolation because, in a way, it was good to kind of get off that carousel. Just like James and Paula said, there was something about taking a moment mm -hmm. and then just finding a new way of working, you know? And so splendid isolation wasn't just that, oh, all of this was really scary, okay? That was something about this, okay, well, actually, how do we explore this together and how, how can we make work in this new environment that a lot of people can see? Because immediately artists were, you know, doing Zoom theatre and they were doing um, different projects as best they can, which were brilliant and really, I think, energising and, you know, um, exciting. But this was going to be a TV piece that was then going to kind of live an eye player for the year. So we want to make, you know, obviously, yeah. the best thing that we possibly could. Mm -hmm. But I think the other thing as well, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, you know, one, well, actually, yeah, you asked me a question. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many people were involved in the whole project then? Oh, there was a lot. There was maybe 14 altogether in the end, but okay. like each, uh, yeah. you, you really were only a director, a writer, an actor, maybe two actors, 
the three, the cameraman, the um, sound person. And then um, in terms of my team, I had uh, Brona as a producer and Adrian as uh, as um, mm. head production. And then it was Fergo kind of overlooking the old thing as well and Stephen as well. So mm. it wasn't an awful lot of people, okay, mm. like the, these dramas, but it was, it, was, it, was, um, it was really good. And we had Rebecca as a dramaturg as well. Mm. I love what you said about, you know, the, the term splendid, the title splendid at isolation, that actually there was some, you know, ex in all of the terrible things that were happening, there were, you know, there were moments of connection and moments of humour even as well. And, and was that important then to, to, um, to kind of acknowledge that and celebrate, and perhaps not celebrate, but acknowledge that in some way? Yeah, because if you remember at that time, and I think we're going into it again, there was a lot yeah. of, okay. Now, I think the fear is more justified now, but at that time, there was kind of like, what is this? And the first reaction, I think, was, was fear. But actually, if you were in a good position, if you were in a privileged position, if you were living at home and it was a place of comfort and warmth and you got to spend more time with your family and stuff, that was kind of interesting. Now, obviously, if you don't have that, it was a lot more dangerous, I think. And I think we just tried to find films that would reflect something that wasn't always going to be doom and gloom, that would give a little bit of hope in each of them. I mean, I think that was important to each of the writers that there would be something, there was a glimmer of hope that there was a way through this and there was a way of still finding the connection somehow mm. together. Yeah. And my yeah. last question before we um, uh, bring Paulette and James back. Um, this lockdown, well, seems far from over right now. So are we going to see more of a splendid isolation? I hope so, yeah. I mean, we are still continuing. Like, I was so fascinated by James and Paulette and what they're doing and stuff. Yeah. You know, like we're going to, we, we have a series of audio uh, plays that we're doing at the moment. I want to do a lot more diversity as much as possible. I feel there's been a full stop in the last world, okay? And I think we mm -hmm. all need to reinvent how we used to work and who we used to work. Because we were definitely on the carousel. Like the, the whole thing about the lyric is, it's not particularly well funded. It relies on 80% of it to get box office. Yeah. So therefore, it kind of leads to a certain kind of program. But we're still very dedicated to new writing as much as possible. And mm. that writing has to emerge. So I feel there's been a full stop in the last world. And somehow we have to go into a new world. It can't be the same thing. We have to re-engage somehow as much as possible. And it, we're still learning that, you know, um, and uh, how we can do that. But mm. the next thing I'm hoping is there's a series of plays for today's, which just happened. And I have a series of plays that I proposed to the BBC who seem to be very interested and I'm hoping they will give us the green light and looking at how to do it because it's a wonderful way for actors and you know writers to get the work to a much broader audience as well. Yeah. And it's also great for the BBC as well. Like it's, you know, sometimes between Northern Ireland it can be very heavy news and light magazine programs, but there is some place for art and drama in the middle of that as well, just to get that out there. Oh, we'll look forward to that. Brilliant. And so let's uh, bring uh, everybody back now for a few questions before we um, turn over to the audience. And remember, if you do have a question for our panel, please pop them uh, into the chat and we'll get through as many as we can. So this question then um, of this, you know, clearly from looking at all of your work, there's a real cross section of programming that's online. Um, and I wondered, this is a question really for everybody. What was the most kind of surprising benefit of creating kind of work online in a digital space? Let's take James first, if you could um, comment on that. I think I've touched on it a little bit already. It's just the sort of the well-being that it brought, mm. both to individually to everyone working on the projects, but also the company and the people surrounding the company. Um, so, yeah, the fact that, that stuff was being made. And it, it was quite good for us as well. It forced our hands because we've been toying with the digital world a bit. We've been doing projects that linked the you know, real and virtual worlds. Um, but we've been shying away from going 100% digital. So it was good mm -hmm. to be forced to do that. Yeah, Paulette, what about you? Um, I think for me, it's how really, how really small the world is. Um, because, you know, when you say you're doing international work, it seems like you're going really far away and you're doing something really far away. But actually technology's made the world so much smaller you know you're working with with people hand in hand in a way that you wouldn't have done before and mm -hmm. so um you know you're allowing artists to collaborate people are getting exposure to techniques and workshops and just being in contact with people in the way that we wouldn't have done 
before mm -hmm. you know we would have thought oh well I can't speak to them because they're in South Africa or I've got to wait because you know they're in Australia or they're in you know Martinique or whatever but you know we've been the world the world's been a, a lot smaller and the fact that we're all in the same position in terms of dealing with the issues around around covid um and so it's it, it just shows you how small the world is in terms of making those those connections mm. jimmy i wondered if you had any any thoughts on that they were both really eloquent answers i mean mm -hmm. I, I totally agree that i think the world is smaller and um, i was surprised i mean we we adapted i think quite well and people did what you're missing at the moment is liveness and just that connection with the audience and it's actually interesting because I work obviously in a big theatre and it's got two huge spaces. You know, one is quite dormant at the moment, which is our big main auditorium. But the Norton, we've turned into a virtual studio, like a little bit like a film in a radio studio. Just we've been able to adapt that quite well. And actually, there's something, again, I think Paula said it as well, is just how we go up forward. I think we've found another thing. We've been forced into finding another way of creating work. Mm whether that be through, you know, Zoom plays, whether that be through um, audio uh, recordings or whatever else. But, you know, we found an outlet to do that. And I think that's, that, that's been the most interesting thing for me is to find that actually it doesn't always just have to be theatre. We can actually move into kind of studio-based and, you know, find, explore this sort of virtual world to an extent. I think we have to do that. Going yeah, forward. and there are clearly a lot of conversations at the moment about monetization for venues and companies and artists. And I wondered if you had, I'm sure you have lots of thoughts on this. Um, James, if I could come to you, I wonder what your thoughts were on the current sustain, uh, situation and, and obviously the sustainability or lack of, of that right now. Yeah, digital doesn't feature in that at all for us. Uh, flexibility as an independent company means that we're looking at, yeah, the distance performances, outdoor performances, uh, just other ways of approaching it really I can't see our really niche kind of work ever generating the numbers that you need to to get uh, did, uh, monetized online. Mm. Paulette what about yourself? <coughs> Excuse me um, I think we do need to move to looking at the way the arts have to be quasi-commercial. I don't think that we're going to survive just being in the subsidised sector. And I think we need to put the va more value and look at how we look at monetising work and how we, um, uh, because one hand feeds the other. So we've just created a new publication called Black Ink. And so it's not just a publication, it's a portal to work. So within that publication, there are QR codes that take you to live work. There's codes that take you to podcasts. And so we're saying that when we give you or you buy this magazine for 15 pounds, but there's about 10 pieces of work in there as well. That 38 artists, mm -hmm. uh, you have to think of other ways of monetar monetizing things. And we have to start thinking in a more commercial way. You know, we're seeing all the problems that we've got within the arts funding system in terms of sustainability. So I think it's really important that we work with that as well and look at placing that value um, and the money on it and, and looking at um, monetization. So I've been very clear on nearly everything that we've done. And if it's only five pounds, people um, saying that it's five pounds for that work it's, it's it's about value because we all know that when we don't put a value on things people don't always um appreciate it even though it's nice to do free mm -hmm. uh, you know sometimes you've got to put a value on it as well for people to really appreciate it so we we've done free and now we're saying um now we need to step it up in terms of us surviving and people need to um support with and we're trying to make it affordable. So a, a lot of our lectures and things online are only like five pounds, you know, but we do feel that people need, need to make some sort of financial contribution for the work. Mm, thank you. Jimmy, what are your thoughts on, on that? I, know, obviously yeah, I, you. I mean, I 100% agree. Like, as I said, we're a subsidized theater to a certain extent. We also have to rely on a box office to a much bigger extent. And obviously that disappeared this year. So donations and stuff were very, very important to um, as, as much as we could get, but also like James, it doesn't really add up to anything. So the first early Zoom stuff we did was all free. It was just to see, explore, to see what kind of audience we got. And it was, it was quite a huge audience for the you speak and that kind of thing. Uh, BBC was obviously, that was a commission. So I mean, we were able to work within the 
quite a tight budget. It wasn't an overly generous budget, but it was a really welcoming budget just to work within that and get that into artists' pockets. Because the Lyric employs upwards of 400, 450 artists, freelance artists a year. Yeah. So the big question we had, we were maybe a 30 person operation that grows into kind of 100 person operation to control it. So the big question is how do we, how do we keep employing and creating work for artists as much as possible? Because we did not want to grow this schism between those who, um, well, I mean, it's there anyway, but just that between, you know, those with kind of um, regular jobs for one of and those who are in the, you know, at the fortunes of freelance work, you know? And so as much as possible, we've tried to create work constantly so we we we've employed over 120 artists this year and hopefully and that's only halfway through the year so i'm hoping we can get more up there as well you know? but it's on a much more limited budget than we were mm -hmm. like i think everything now like we these series of audio recordings we've done we've had less of an audience than we had for say the zoom but they monetize wise have been much better so it's a six pound ticket with maybe potentially you can go up to 12 or 20 pound donation and the average price we're getting at the moment is about nine pounds which is really interesting yeah sure. that's what people are willing to pay for this kind of work and um you know it's done very well actually i mean i i, I was surprised at the numbers and i'm really grateful to them we have a really great audience in the lyric the lyric as i said earlier it never closed its doors all through the troubles it's really held very very dear by the people of belfast and the north in general um, and we just, we need it to keep that connection with the audience as much as possible. And we need to keep going on that. But I think we're all in quite a scary time. All these fundings and all these announcements and all these kind of things have been set out, all made everybody shut up. Once they said 1.5 billion, it made a growing artistic movement go quiet because, of, well, oh, that sounds amazing. But actually, when you get into the fine detail of it, it gets really scary. And we're not seeing that money yet. You know, so we are really in a very precarious place. The arts have not been saved by this government in any way yet. Sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> I could talk about that uh, all day, but uh, we have lots of questions come in from the audience. So we're going to move to those now. Um, the first question, I think this one is, is just a general question. Uh, has anyone got any tips for generating ideas when your team are all working remotely? I mean, visual arts, and it's a bit up and down on the ideas front, good days and bad days. And that's from Rebecca. I don't know if anyone wants to take that question. Paulette. Um, well, one of the things that we did at the beginning of lockdown within all of this and working remotely is that I set days where we watched or listened to something, then as a team discussed it. So, you know, I'm a Toni Morrison fan, so we did the pieces I Am, so we watched that, Freedom Summer, different things. But through that discussion, it helps to generate ideas, but it was also important to keep people alive to the issues that we were working with. So we were working with Windrush, we were working with Black Lives Matter, we were working with Brexit, and we had COVID. I needed to keep um, the energy alive and the issues, and so we were aware of it so we would um i would set a film or uh, something to listen to or something to read and then we would have a half a you know half a day session on that because people were working remotely as well they were isolated and it was a way of keeping the team together but also a way of generating ideas uh, it, that that worked for us yeah jimmy or, or james any any um suggestions there that you want to add yeah as um you may have guessed from my talk i'm a massive obsessive fan of uh, form meeting or challenging content and yeah. formal constraints so um our formal constraint was we couldn't be in the same room and had to do it on zoom so how does that push your creative process so in the visual arts world you know you've only got a pencil what's the most crazy thing you can do with a pencil you've only got a house emulsion paintbrush how do you do that so what is it about the constraints or the difficulties of your situation mm. that you can twist to your advantage? I suppose it's that martial mm. arts mm. thing of using your enemies, you know, weight and speed against them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm going to go on to the next question now, actually. Um, what has been the respective audience views from the projects that have been discussed? So um, let's go to Jimmy first for Splendid Isolation. The view well it all mostly very 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 positive i mean i i think um particularly um because it happened so quick and the artists involved i think had um responded so dynamically so i had nothing but positivity about a uh, splendid isolation and um, i think uh um 
and I think it was well judged. I mean, I think for the most part, you know, um, 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 you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, one of our missions is to help try and get things, you know, keep things happening. And just to go back to that previous question about kind of inspiring, it is to keep our team are constantly engaged, trying to say, well, what project can we do next? Mm. And Splendid Isolation was one thing. Like you'd ask if we're going to do a second Splendid Isolation. I think it exists by itself as it is. And I would want to do something completely different. Sure. The audience embraced it. Yeah, there's no two ways about it. That's great. Paulette, uh, have you any thoughts on that? Sorry, on audience? Yeah, the question on uh, in terms of the responses uh, from your project, what the audience responses were. Audience responses have been fantastic um, in terms of people coming on a journey with us mm -hmm. and also us uh, being able to reach further afield. So most people have, have welcomed it. You know, they've welcomed, some people welcomed the opportunity with 30 <laughs> seconds of freedom just to get involved. There was yeah. something for people to get involved in, something for them to think about, something for them to do. For, for others, it was just to uh, keep them al uh, alert to the issues that we're all tackling and to think of it from another perspective. So we've been very privileged in terms of the audience engagement in that um, we've been able to maintain that and grow um, our audiences uh, as well, um, which, has been, which has been fantastic for us. Yeah, and James, what about yourself and Stanska? Um, I think it's sort of generally positive. I'm the worst person in the world to ask about this because I tend to ignore <laughs> the world and just do my thing and hope people <laughs> like it. Well, there's a, nothing wrong with that at all. Um, next question then. So, um, this is from uh, Vishal. Do you think online, I probably should put my glasses on, that might help, mightn't it? I wonder why I was squinting. There we go. So do you think online performances, i.e. full theatre productions, can happen and be monetized in the Zoom environment? What do you think would be necessary to make it commercially viable? Or is it better to just wait until theatres reopen? So I suppose that's covering some of the same, same territory that we did earlier. But do you think that, yeah, um, online performances via Zoom can be monetized? I don't know. Um, any other thoughts on that? Um, Sorry, but yeah, yeah, like they are being. I mean, there is quite a big audience for it and, uh, online stuff as well. And also, part of it, what I liked at the beginning was seeing some archive performance productions that I had wanted to see for years. Mm -hmm. And became mm -hmm. it was brilliant to, to, to watch certain things as well. So I actually quite enjoy watching them. I don't think they replace in any way theatre whatsoever, but they can certainly be monetized. And actually, the success of the NT Live thing proves that. Like people go into cinema to watch live theatre. Mm. You know, uh, currently we have this amazing uh, production company called Big Telly who are doing a version of the Scottish play. I'm too superstitious to say it. Mm. And that's part of the Belfast um, International Festival. And that's getting huge audiences. And it's really inventive. It's a bit like what James was showing in terms of panels, in terms of the different... It's a bit Peter Greenaway is what I find. Oh, yeah. you know, an awful lot of it's quite formal kind of settings and stuff. But it's, it's a really interesting uh, production. Mm. Uh, I certainly would like to continue it, but I really want the theatres to reopen. I think that's important to stay. We do need to get that happening when we can, when it's safe. Yeah. James, I, thought, I, I echo um, Jimmy about keeping the theatres open, but mm -hmm. I think the, the biggest thing for recording, um, and I'll say very specifically in terms of a diversity perspective, is uh, allowing us to actually now build an archive. So we've got an archive and the things that you struggle to find is archives of work that has happened from black and Asian people. And the work is out there, but it was never archived in that way. And so some of the work that we're doing, some of the biggest jazz greats played at De Montfort Hall in Leicester. So in the um, late 50s and early 60s, you had Ella Fitzgerald mm -hmm. and people like this there, but where's the information? Where's the archives? So this information has been lost or it's hidden or we haven't archived it in the first place. Mm -hmm. Doing things online from a diversity led organization means, and because we have an archive as well, means mm -hmm. it's a depository for the future, but for people to be able to have that access to that information and to learn and to grow. So there are lots of positive things that we can look at as well from yeah. doing the online and in terms of how you curate and how you hold that information and how that information can be used in the future in terms of education, especially when we look at the issues around the decolonization of the curriculum Brilliant. that's great thank you james what about um any other thoughts uh yeah i i think um video is just the worst possible way of watching <laughs> theater so um 
I'm trying to make some stuff that's 30 seconds long now. Yeah. It's still a theatre response to being online, I think. Uh, yeah, that's just me. I think you have yeah. to be in the room because theatre lets you do stuff live that you can't do online. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, it's also really, really expensive to do some, I mean, the really big budget stuff, you can get a sense of what it's like. I mean, some, yeah. of, some of those NT live films are amazing, but that's so expensive to do at that level, to try and make it into a film of a performance. No, I, I agree with that, but I do think people are inventive. And I think there is two companies here, like Big Telly and Cahoots, who currently have shows on live. They go live, like you have to buy a ticket and they're, mm -hmm. they're not recordings or anything, they're actual live events and have all, you know, you know, usually go seamlessly, can have the odd problem, but they're really exciting to watch. And I think both of them are currently on at the moment and worth watching and are not expensive in the way the NT Live. I totally agree with James, but it, there is a way of looking at a low-budget way of this, doing this as well. Yeah. There's another question just come in now from Jasmine. Um, Jasmine asks, how important is it to you that lockdown, online showings, etc., have opened up the arts for people with conditions like agoraphobia? Is this positive change, do you think, recognised uh, currently within the arts? I want to take that one. I would say that the arts are always aware of it, but you know, it's it's always been an issue about access and how you access people and where you're located and what it is that your organization is set up to do. Um, so I think, um, again, it goes back to the thing that I believe that um, as much as I'm, I love live performances where I think my heart is, but I know that through technology, we've been able to reach and open up other doors that we might not have been able to do before. Mm -hmm. Great. James or Jimmy, anything to add? Um, James, you wanna go? <laughs> yeah, passing the buck. <laughs> um, I would be really happy if, if that were some good that came out of this. Yeah. I, I echo that, but you had asked about splendid isolation too, and I, I think one thing that we were lacking in was a diversity thing, because a lot of the artists that we had worked in, I mean, are, you know, white, you know, for want of a better term, in terms of Northern Ireland, and Lata was really interesting, fantastic uh, performer that I'd only met last year, she's, you know, from, um, her heritage is Indian, but she's grown up in East Belfast all her life. And her story about Belfast, I found fascinating because it was a story I did not know. I'm from Dublin, so I'm a stranger in Belfast as well. So the way you can think about Belfast can be in cliches, but actually Belfast is a really interesting, diverse area and has all these kind of differences. And I think if we were going to go again, particularly with disability and particularly with, you know, um, different cultures, I would like to do focus much more on that if that was possible. Yeah. James is sitting this one out. <laughs> no, I've said, I said that. I'd very oh, you happy. did, you did, you did, you did. I'll let you off on that one. And there's one, uh, two more questions. Um, uh, the quote, this question is about, is a general one for the group, um, but I'm really looking forward to, um, I'm looking for, sorry, dance and theatre training. Um, one thing, uh, I am older and London based. So let me read that again. Yeah, the question is, for the group, but I really I'm looking for dance and theatre training. Uh, and please note one thing is that I'm older and London based. So any tips for dance and theatre training currently? Um, I, I would say that we um, age doesn't really factor in in it for us. So you know, one year we did um, something with um, uh, Jemena Cogney. Mm -hmm. and we had Namron and we had Nora Chipameru. So everybody I've mentioned is over 50 and the latter two over 70. We never used the, uh, the word age once and we sold everything out. So I think the work that's out there, if you align yourself or look to the right sort of organizations, um, mm -hmm. I think the work is already, already there. We've got a whole platform of work towards the end of this month on dance with um, two master classes that uh, again that people can access and we've got the big debate about dance I think I think there's lots of things out there it's just about um, being mindful who you um, connect up with mm -hmm. yeah and I've just got one, one last question for um, everyone uh, and then we're going to wrap up so that's um, what all of you have uh, one thing that you would say has been good about the lockdown experience um, and that's really thinking about the acceleration of digital and or, or creation of smart uh, ideas, et cetera, and creative ideas. So one thing that you think, if there's one thing that's been most positive, what would that be? 
Let's start with Jimmy. Thanks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just one thing, I, I think I've already said it, but this idea of like broadening our audience, you know, we've had audiences yeah. in Australia and um, um, New York and Canada and stuff as well, which we've never got just local, you know, unless we toured. And I still want the touring, the touring, I still want to bring good vibrations to New York. But that idea of opening up the world or making it a little bit smaller in a time when it is actually shutting down, where it's actually terrifying to go somewhere else, where you feel you'd be attacked with pitchforks if you go down to a village in Donegal because you're, you've got a, you know, like a Northern Reg because whatever. But it's just, it is interesting that in one way our world is getting smaller, but we can expand it, you know. Now, that's maybe an optimistic way of looking at it, but I've had correspondence with people from all over the world, India as well, like we're hoping to do a co-production with an Indian group. Um, from Mumbai in, next year and that's slightly based on this it's slightly based on previous conversations as well so so that's interesting as well yeah great James yeah I think being able to hear from Paulette and Jimmy and just people that you wouldn't otherwise have encountered and um, the sort of solidarity between artists as well um, just uh, yeah the sort of jumping on zoom calls in a way you'd not necessarily jump on a train and that would be a terrible logistic expensive thing so <laughs> it's just been on that level it's been fantastic and it's also been great as a bit of a digital denier being absolutely forced to do it <laughs> and actually finding I quite enjoy it yeah that's great thank you and Paulette um I suppose I'm just going to use the word resilience it's just to show that how resilient the arts and the cultural sector has been and continues to be and also creative you know um, because that's what we've had to do we've had to take something that was part of probably the business world in terms of technology and make it into an art form and truly be able to exploit and explore that art form so digital technology has become an art form rather than it just being a business tool and 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 so using it in a very very different way and pushing the boundaries of it and and doing things that you don't even know how to do but you think well I want to do that and you you just getting technology to to to, to work in in, 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 a, in a new way mm, thank you very much um well we are out of time now but it's really been a fascinating discussion um i just want to say a huge thank you to our guests today paulette james and jimmy also thank you to lara and chris the program curators and bbc academy this is part of the digital cities program and uh, this event has been in partnership with the School of Digital Arts, our SODA at Manchester Metropolitan University, which opens in 2021. And thank you to Arts Council England for funding the panel. Please make sure you check out the Digital Cities website for more information about other masterclasses happening later in the week. And Hello Culture, Hello Culture will be back again at Digital Cities next month on Wednesday, the 25th of November. So be sure to keep an eye on the booking links for more sessions. So thank you, everybody.